Okay, well, good morning. Uh, we'll continue this lecture on COPD. And in the previous lecture, we finished <coughs> with this diagram from Malcolm Sparrow in Perth. So this shows, uh, just to recapitulate, human lung. So this is human fetal lung. Um, and the development of the relationship between nerves and airway smooth muscle fibres in the developing lung. And I mentioned to you that airway smooth muscle is morphogenic and helps these patterns form. So we can see here the very, very close proximity of nerves to smooth muscle. And this is quite important in the context of COPD and the theory of treatment of COPD. So if we look at the wiring diagram to the human lung, of where the cholinergic fibres come from. They all project from the 10th cranial nerve, which is also called the vagus nerve, and that innervates many organs and carries information from the brain to uh, various organs. So uh, the fibres move through ganglia and then synapse with smooth muscle and other structures in the airways. And when they're activated, they release acetylcholine. Now, very importantly, the nerves that we saw were both afferent, which are sensory nerves, and efferent, which send signals to the lung. So there are sensory nerves in the lung that are irritated by local inflammation. And we find their endings in the same position as the points of release of acetylcholine. And so this means that you can have in a lung disease, very commonly, what's called a vago-vagal reflex arc where sensory information from irritated lung tissue is sent to the brain stem and then triggers the release and the reflex of the acetylcholine locally. So this is very important in COPD because the chemicals released in damaged tissue irritate those fibres. It's also an important mechanism in more severe forms of asthma and in acute infections in asthma. Now, very importantly, if you do a molecular audit and ask where does all of the acetylcholine come from, it's quite surprising. In the inflamed tissue, this is true in COPD and also in asthma, there is an additional source of acetylcholine which is not from the nerves, so it's non-neuronal acetylcholine. And this is because inflamed tissue can upregulate the synthetic machinery for acetylcholine and produce it locally. So about half of all the acetylcholine is actually not produced by nerve activity, but rather by the tissue itself. And then it activates receptors here on the muscle to cause constriction. Um, what's really important in the art of treating COPD is to know that those muscarinic receptors are very widely distributed in the body. So we want to avoid side effects for drugs particularly cardiovascular side effects, and remember that about half of all people from CO with COPD will die from a cardiovascular complication. If we do the audit, and remember that famous Lowy experiment when the vagus nerve was stimulated, the effect was to slow the heart. There are extensive innovations of the heart with muscarinic, uh, uh, muscarinic sensitive fibres, and in particular, the sinoatrial node which controls the rate of the heart is innervated by both sympathetic fibres but also by the vagus nerve. And so if there is a spillover of our drugs from the lung to the heart, this can compound cardiovascular side effects. And so when these drugs are developed, great attention is uh, made in how do we localise the effect to the lung and minimise peripheral side effects. Um, as I mentioned, the muscarinic receptors are very widely distributed. And the acronym to remember their side effects is SLUDS, which is secretion, lacrimation, urination, and defecation. People who are intoxicated by nerve gases, which increases the amount of acetylcholine because it inhibits the breakdown, hypersecrete, have tears, have uncontrollable urination, and defecate. And the side effect of anticholinergic agents is the opposite, the drying of secretions, drying of tears, problems with urination and changes to the bowel, as well as these heart problems. So it's really important to localise the effect to the lung. Now we know that many of the peripheral effects are mediated through different receptors, but it's quite hard to get absolute purity. If we do the audit, lung versus heart, 
We know in the lung there are a number of receptors. There are five subtypes of muscarinic receptors. The one that we're most interested in is the M3 receptor because this is the receptor that's on the smooth muscle. It's coupled to GQ and therefore activates phospholipase C and calcium release. And this, of course, leads to constriction of muscle. But these pathways also can turn on pro-inflammatory pathways and so may drive some aspects of inflammation in the disease. And there's some evidence that antimuscarinics do have slight anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, the M2 receptors are on the heart. Different coupling, they affect the rate and the force of the heart. Okay? So it would be optimal to have a drug that is absolutely pure for the M3 receptor and does not occupy the M2 receptor. So for example, in the field of beta receptors, there are three mammalian beta receptors in humans, beta 1, beta 2, beta 3. Medicinal chemists have made essentially now absolutely pure beta 2 agonists, which relax the airway smooth muscle very well and have almost no meaningful activity at beta 1 or beta 3. Huge problem in the muscarinic field. If we go into the molecular evolution of these receptors, in ancient times there was a primordial one. We follow its branching down to the cholinergic division here, and we find that the M2 and the M3 receptors evolve quite recently and together. So this means there is little sequence uh, difference between them, and when we look to the active site of where acetylcholine binds, uh, it's quite interesting. There is tremendous homology in the binding site. So here we see a very beautiful diagram. The M2 receptor in yellow, which is the heart side effect molecule, and the M3 receptor in blue, complex with teotropium, which is one of the most commonly used anticholinergics, probably the most successful in clinical practice. And we can see that there is almost no separation in the binding between the M2 and the M3 receptor. And in fact, in pharmacological terms, it's proven extremely difficult to make a pure M3 blocker that has no activity at M2. Um, what has happened, however, is to make things that are called kinetically selective drugs. So when you go into the deep structure of the receptor, it turns out there's a little lip here in the binding site. And this lip preferentially affects the retention of certain agonists and antagonists for the M2 and the M3 receptor. So there's this very interesting phenomenon where it's possible to make kinetically selective drugs. If you measure their affinity to the receptor, it's about the same. They bind at the same site with the same affinity. But if you measure the dissociation constant, how quickly do they leave the receptor, it has been possible to make molecules that are quite sticky for the M3 receptor that have long dissociation constants and short M2 dissociation constants. So this means that they will occupy the M2 receptors but leave them whereas they will be retained on the M3. And of course if you then use those drugs by inhalation and optimize their physical properties so they're retained in the lung and have little transit into the blood, it's proven possible to make really really safe essentially M3 blockers that have little cardiovascular side effect. And this is actually why that particular molecule, teotropium, has proven to be so popular with physicians. It has a very excellent cardiovascular safety profile. Very interesting pharmacology. Now the last section of the, I think we'll be finished early with this uh, lecture today because we've come to the end of the slides, is to go through the complexes of COPD. So I mentioned COPD is an umbrella term, three conditions, emphysema, bronchiolitis, bronchitis, and it commonly associates with many other problems. So half of all people die from cardiovascular problems, weak muscles, diabetes, the asthma overlap, this problem of recurrent infections, in some patients autoimmune disease, and cancer. These are all the comorbidities of COPD, and we now talk about the disease as part of a complex comorbidome syndrome, where you have multiple possibilities of disease of which COPD is the one. And it's literally the case that your first symptom will dictate whether you're classified as a heart patient or a COPD patient. So if it's, oh, I feel a bit tight in the chest, you'll be a cardiovascular patient. Many of those patients have comorbid COPD. 
If people complain of breathlessness first, they'll be a COPD patient, but very often have heart disease, which is not particularly adequate for their therapy. Now, this is the COPD clock, if you like. Imagine a clock going through the whole of your life, and this is where people choose with their friends behind the shelter sheds at school or at a party to have their first cigarette. And the types of processes that happen with increasing exposure to cigarettes, but these are also true for air pollution exposure. So on exposure to the very first cigarette you ever have, your cilia don't work properly. The toll receptors, which are bacteria sensing receptors, are immediately impaired. So even short term exposure to smoke increases infection risk. Antioxidants, which protect you from damage to smoke, are inactivated as are a large number of molecules that defend against infection and the ability of macrophages to remove damaged cells, which is called ephrocytosis, is immediately impaired. And this means that rather than clearing up damaged tissue, those cells split and release their contents which are irritating to tissue. And very importantly, catabasis, which is healing of the lung or other tissues, is also immediately impaired as is the ability of antigen presenting cells to trigger immune responses. Now these things, if you stop smoking, are largely reversible. There's a critical point which varies in time between different people, but after some years of exposure, where if you stop smoking, you never go back to the ground state. There are changes that are permanent, and these are due to epigenetic imprinting, where the DNA starts to get methylation groups on it, which changes the profile of genes, where macrophages go down differentiation pathways that are irreversible and lose their normal function, where the innate immune cells become overactive and inappropriately active, and interestingly where iron becomes abundant because iron catalyzes oxidative reactions and it was released from blood. And at this point, when these uh, host defense mechanisms are impaired, the lung very often becomes colonized with bacteria maybe low-level chronic infection, not causing acute bronchitis, but normally the lung is almost sterile, and COPD patients very often have bacteria always growing in the lung. And this is when the comorbidities become particularly prominent. We start to get changes, chemical changes in the extracellular matrix here, and as we go forward and these comorbidities are more prominent, we start to get very overt changes in um, the immune system, leading to recurrent infections and pneumonias, the immune system becomes really exhausted and key immune defences that should help to protect against cancer are reversed and rather promote cancer. These are the checkpoint inhibitors. We may then start to get really strange changes in the immune system and the mutations which started to accumulate here have been compounded and cancer becomes prominent. So this is a very, very slow process leading to an extrable change. Uh, COPD exacerbations are a huge problem in Australia. They're one of the biggest cost blocks in our hospital system, and this is true in almost every country. And we know they come in at least three flavours, those triggered by viruses, which can lead to outgrowth of bacteria, the infectious type, very, very common. More than half of all exacerbations are of this type, typically with neutrophilic inflammation the eosinophil associated one. And remember yesterday I mentioned Professor Pafford's work showing that this is the type of cell that predicts whether the patient will or will not respond to steroids. So if patients have this cell, you can reduce their exacerbation rate by treating with steroids. But steroids actually make neutrophils survive, whereas they kill these types of cells here. Um, air quality. Exposure to poor air triggers the uh, exacerbations in some patients. And there's another type that we don't understand where patients have deteriorations that are not clearly linked to inflammation, infection or irritation. And these may be due to changes in muscle or other drivers or changes in heart function. This is not understood. About a quarter of all exacerbations are of that type. So reducing these becomes a huge uh, problem and a very good thing if we could do it. Now what's really interesting, I mentioned that most patients with COPD diagnosed in their 70s. It's a big issue. We'd like to treat them much earlier when they have lung structure preserved, but at that point they're well, okay? Ostensibly well. They're not complaining of lung symptoms 
even though they have them. So there's been a great deal of work recently to find prodromal problems that are medical that could first help to detect patients at risk but also provide a strategy to treat that would allow us to come in decades earlier. And some of the most interesting work has been this work from David Price's team. So David Price gets hold of huge databases from the UK and informatically grinds it. He's a very intelligent chess physician. And he did this uh, analysis here. So this is the time when patients were diagnosed with COPD. And he went back into the healthcare records saying, well, you know, they're quite old. Were there health resource consumption signals that suggested other problems much earlier? And we can see a really interesting double signal. So an LRTI is a lower respiratory tract infection. And this is revealed in the health records by prescription of certain types of antibiotics. And we see actually about 20 years prior to the first presentation for COPD, the day of diagnosis, that patients start to have more chest infections with this exponential function and in fact have really serious failure of their immune system. Many patients first present with a life-threatening chest infection. That's their point of diagnosis. And then we see as well the number of chest x-rays that have been ordered. The chest x-rays are typically ordered when physicians suspect that the patient may have pneumonia. It's a convenient way to confirm pneumonia. So we can infer from this, again, that starts about two decades earlier, we start getting more infections, but also more serious infections. And then as things go on, it gets very, very serious. And patients typically die from these recurrent exacerbations. It's one of the things that kills them. And it puts a lot of stress on the heart as well and makes muscle very weak when this happens. So you can start to imagine, and if you're a creative person, one thing we might want to do is to restore the immune system about 20 years prior to the first diagnosis by reversing or tackling those problems that have impaired mucosal immunity. And this is an enormous opportunity now in COPD research. This is the famous work from Jürgen Schützer, who is an informatics specialist. And he was working on a problem of the plasticity of macrophages. So macrophages can express about 87% of the human genome. They're remarkably flexible cells that adopt different phenotypes and functions in different tissues and different circumstances. And he was doing a study looking at their plasticity in response to different types of signals. As part of the work, this is actually a side finding in the main study, which is published in Cell, a very prestigious journal. Uh, he noticed that the transcriptional profile of smokers differed markedly from that of COPD patients. So we see if we analyse the transcriptional program of smokers who don't have COPD, that there's strong activation of the inflammatory pathway, revealed here by the NF-kappa B signals, a main inflammation driving transcription factor. And of course, this has been where companies have placed their efforts to make uh, anti-inflammatory agents to suppress inflammation driven by smoke. When you use those types of agents in COPD patients, you get a serious problem because we look to the transcriptional profile of the COPD patients and we see, oh, a huge module here around inflammatory response. Sort of makes sense, block inflammation. Huge problems with immune system here. But look at the key, green means upregulated and blue means downregulated. So when you take this paradigm and take anti-inflammatory agents and use them in advanced COPD, you invariably worsen the patient's condition because they already have profoundly suppressed mucosal immunity. And so the NF-kappa B blockers, the MAP kinase blockers, the neutrophil inhibitors, all these things that make a lot of sense are really stupid to use in COPD. So I mentioned this module is in smokers who don't have COPD. Perhaps blocking these in their 40s and 50s would preserve lung function, but certainly those types of strategies do not work in patients who are already diagnosed with COPD. It's a huge difference. So again, if you're going to be a future drug discoverer, a future entrepreneur or investor, or a philanthropist, this is fundamental. We need to solve this problem to preserve lung structure, but in current COPD, it's absolutely the false strategy. Right? So don't invest in this sort of rubbish because you'll lose your money. And we know the mechanisms. Our lab's worked on this for decades. 
One of the problems is that cigarette smoke chemically modifies proteins inside the cell. So here we see macrophages that have been exposed to cigarette smoke extract that's been freshly prepared. These cells should normally be able to detect and destroy bacteria. So when we put them with fluorescently tagged genetically engineered E. coli, these cells should be full of green dots. But we see nothing here because the chemical modification of the sensors to detect the macrophages have been impaired by carbonylation, which is a chemical process that inactivates them. Now this is largely mediated through oxidative stress and can be partially restored by antioxidants. And that's been known for a while now. The medical issue is though that it's really, really hard in COPD to get sufficient concentrations of antioxidants into the lung because there is massive oxidative stress in advanced disease. So although we know this would work as a strategy, it's proven very hard to get the antioxidants into the lung to do that and other strategies are needed to do it. But we know the mechanisms which are very interesting. Now the last part is the death of COPD patients from lung cancer. If you do the audit, <coughs> as disease becomes more severe, and we classify COPD by gold stage, which is the Global Obstructive Lung Disease Consortium, based on the uh, ratio of the force vital capacity to the FEV1, which is a measure of lung function. It doesn't see the deep airways, but it's a reasonable measure. As there is more lung destruction, more airflow limitation, the rate of COPD goes up. Now we might think, oh, these guys have smoked more, therefore have worse lung function. No. It's not associated with dose of cigarettes. This is a susceptibility marker. So patients who get more lung damage have the same, roughly, exposure to cigarettes as those who have lower levels. But if you also have uh, airflow limitation, you're much more likely to get cancer. And this means there are shared molecular mechanisms between the diseases. That's the uh, obvious inference from it. And it's now supported by good genomics. So if we look to the global trends, these are the statistics most recently published. The increase in cigarette smokes, which became very fashionable after the First World War, here, and then even more so after the Second World War. And then with a lag of about 20 years, a rise in the incidence of lung cancer. Initially in men, because of gender biases in smoking. Then of course the wonderful 60s in liberation, and women thought it would be great to smoke and we see women's smoking rates going up and the death rate for women going up. Our public education, so the Surgeon General's report on, so Fletcher and Pito published the first epidemiology saying that cigarettes caused lung cancer in 1950. 1950, so almost 70 years ago. That was proven to be true. And then the Surgeon General's report on smoking and ad adverse lung health, which affected men's behavior was published in 67, uh, the first report saying this is bad. And so we've seen over time, also with government policy, uh, smoking rates coming down in men, particularly more educated men, and death rates falling. But this won't go down to zero because smoking is not the only cause of lung cancer now. Bad air quality is a major cause. About 8% of all world lung cancer is caused by bad air quality already, and this will get worse. So we'll see these things come down but stay quite high. So here's a very realistic situation. This is Dr. Dan Steinford, a uh, fantastic physician and collaborator, performing an endoscopy on a man who coughed up some blood, was referred to the Royal Melbourne for assessment, and is now having an EBUS bronchoscopy, which is an ultrasound bronchoscopy. So a lesion has been found in his lung, and Dr. Steinford, assisted by keen trainees here, is placing an ultrasound probe into his airway, positioning it down so he can see the nodule, and then using a needle biopsy to pull out the tissue. I often go to these procedures. There you see the poor person there. They're usually done awake, sedated but awake. Very anxious looking patient. Uh, the procedure's done, and of course, to get a good diagnostic yield, the cells are passed immediately to a cytologist who's in the procedure room who checks that the sample is adequate for diagnostic purposes. And so Dr. Steinfeld will ask, do we have a good sample? And the cytologist will reply, oh yes doctor, we have many small cells in this sample. So that's a death sentence. 
that means that patient almost certainly has small lung cell, uh, small cell lung cancer, or there'll be another coded uh, message coming back. So the physician mind turns at that point to surgery or not surgery and targeted therapy. It's a really, really uh, heavy thing to be involved in. So this is what would be done here. And I can actually recommend this wonderful article published by Klaus Rabe, who's a colleague and friend, just a few days ago in the New England Journal uh, to take a look at. You've got the citation in the, in the notes. What needs to be done is to sample the tumour, but also sample the lymph nodes. So this is important for what's called staging. You need to get a specific diagnosis of what type of cancer this may be, but also whether it's spread to the lymph nodes because this affects the survival rate and also whether surgery should be performed or not. So this is a typical outcome. Uh, the cytologist and histologist will classify the tumour by histological type. There are four major types of lung cancer. The small cell lung cancer is large cell, adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas. And that's done histologically. And we know that cancer develops through the intersection of the mutagens in smoke plus inflammation. So, of course, smoke is pro-inflammatory but also mutagenic. So it introduces mutations into the DNA but also irritates the tissue which increases the replication rate of the cell. So it's a mitotic effect. That's called the promotion effect. And for cancer to occur, single genetic lesions are seldom sufficient. Particularly in lung cancer, you get multiple genetic lesions. You need to turn on key oncogenic drivers and KRAS is one of the worst ones. And typically you need to lose the activity of tumour suppressors. And when these conditions are met, the lesions progress from dysplasia, which is abnormal tissue, to cancer. And so a patient <coughs> who's had that type of procedure would have their tumour classified histologically. Once the histology is known, <coughs> it's important to understand whether the patient has certain key mutations in the genome because lung cancers, have, like other cancers, have been pulled apart with molecular science looking for susceptible mutations where we can make precision drugs. So the system here in Melbourne and elsewhere will be looking for epidermal growth factor mutations, BRAF mutations, changes in ALK or ROS, and some patients now with the VCCC are getting a high throughput screening or, or sequencing. And increasingly, patients are typed for what's called immune checkpoint inhibitor expression. So PD-1 ligand is one of our main defences in our tissue, which normally prevents our own immune system from attacking ourselves. Okay? Uh, so it stops immune cells from being able to kill tissue. If an immune cell is armed to destroy a cell, the PD-1 signal will say, whoa, whoa, stop. Don't kill me. I love you. Just leave me alone. We're friends. Cancers are clever in the molecular sense. There's intense Darwinian selection on those cells to survive. One, and our immune system detects that uh, lung cancers in particular, because they're genomically unstable and produce unusual proteins on the cell surface, our immune system detects that they're foreign and tries to kill them probably many very early mutations are actually eliminated by our immune system. But when this system is upregulated here, the uh, PD-1 system, or the checkpoint inhibitors, that immune attack is halted. Uh, we also know that macrophages, I showed you the Schutzer diagram, macrophages infiltrate these tumours as well and also provide suppressing signals that stops immune attack on the cancer. So this is very, very important for therapy. And so the patient will be typed. These are the main mutations that we have identified, or we, the field, have identified in lung cancer. Uh, some of them are very uncommon, affecting only 1% or 2% of patients. Now, the pharmaceutical industry has tried to make inhibitors of all of these activating mutations, and some of them have proven tractable. The one everyone would like to block is KRAS. It's associated with aggressive, very, very uh, severe tumours. Uh, 
and it's very technically difficult to block. So no one has succeeded yet to make a KRAS blocker, but there are blockers for other uh, agents here, other agencies of disease. More than half of the tumours, though, are driven by mutations that we don't understand, no known mutations. So if patients are lucky, they will have one of these mutations. If they're very lucky, they'll have a small tumour in a, surgical position, a surgically accessible position where someone like Philip Antipa, professor of surgery, can remove their lung. So I actually had one of my aunts ring me up. This is literally true. Darling, she said, well, she's a, a very, uh, enjoys her life, like Princess Margaret. Darling, I've just been coughing a little bit of blood. I'm sure it's nothing. I just thought I'd tell you. Oh, what we should do is get you down to Royal Melbourne Hospital to see Professor Irving. Okay, coughing blood in smoke is a very serious uh, sign. She was incredibly lucky. She had a small stage one tumour in the deep lung, and Professor Antipa could resect the lung using keyhole surgery, and she was actually doing crosswords the same day after the, the surgery. Probably cured. A very, very unusual outcome. Most patients have inoperable tumours that have spread, metastasized, and then these agents are used here. Now, we should really understand the limitation of these. All of these are multi-billion dollar drug targets. The medicines against these make a lot of money. All of them are life extending and none of them is curative because the cancers are genomically unstable by this stage. We can block some of these driving mutations which will cause the tumour to shrink and limit its growth but not all cells in the tumour will be susceptible. The tumours are heterogeneous. There will be some cells that will be resistant intrinsically to these types of agents that will progress and lead to an ex uh, uh, a relapse of the disease. So what's captivated everyone's attention has been the discovery of the immune checkpoint blockers which were first worked out in the 1990s and have struggled through various indications. So we know there are two important immune checkpoints for T cell activation. When antigen presenting cells talk to T cells first, one of the key checkpoints that stops T cells from being activated is CTLA-4. This, this is a dampening signal. So if you block this signal, T cells become much more activated. And then the activated cell will attack the tumor cell. And as I mentioned, the PD-1 system is the don't kill me signal that tumors use to suppress. So this science was worked out. Monoclonal antibodies were made against these targets, against each of the components actually. They've been through clinical trials and we call this Onco-Lotto, the lottery of the clinical trials because we know the science, but it's unclear which of these agents will be the winner. And again, if you're an investor, um, you pay great attention to the science because the stakes here are enormous. So, so for example, a very large company, AstraZeneca, recently had a large trial which was trying to combine a blocker for this molecule with a molecule for this pathway, a double blocker. Okay? The theory was very strong. Inhibit at two checkpoints should get deeper effects on lung cancer. What actually happened was the, uh, the therapeutic benefit was not as good as a single inhibitor and the side effect profile was worse. So the penalty for that company, and the analysts were like this, they were waiting for the result to be published. It would have been share price 15% up, which is about $2 billion, or share price 15% down, lose $2 billion. It was that. Very interesting outcome. So, and this is what got everyone so interested. I think these are the last two slides. The first clue that this would work as a strategy was a study with nivolumab, which is a PD-1 blocker. It was, here's a patient with a cancer in the lung. And I should point out that although we're looking at the lung here, the real benefit of these molecules is to treat metastatic disease that's spread outside the lung, okay? Because it will do this elsewhere. The tumor's in the lung the agent was administered and initially people were horrified because the tumours got larger on the scans. Yeah. 
made the cancer worse, people thought. No, what actually happened was the immune checkpoint inhibitor allowed inflammatory and destructive cells to flood into the tumour, literally increasing its bulk. They destroyed the tumour here, uh, producing a lasting remission in this lucky patient. Okay. Now, which one won the race? Interestingly, was it the ligand, was it the receptor? If you were in the field or in oncology, you'd be very interested in what is the best possible treatment for the patients. Turns out that pembrolizumab is currently the safest, not, not safe, but the safest, best tolerated, and the most effective molecule for treating patients with lung cancer. And here's the statistics here. So typically a kinase inhibitor would produce this sort of benefit here. We'd see a separation in survival. These patients are dying, these patients are living. And then over time, the curves would converge because of the escape and refractoriness to the kinase inhibitor. What's caught everyone's attention is this, the fraction of patients who don't die, who have a lasting remission. And we can see under best circumstances between 20 to 30 to even 35, 40% of patients can have a very, very lasting clinical benefit to these agents. So if you're a scientist or an investor or if you're a future discoverer, the mind immediately thinks, ah, yeah, what about these guys? What's happening here? Why can't we cure all patients with these immune checkpoint inhibitors? What are the other strategies that tumours are using to evade immune defence? Right. And at that interesting point, where your minds are hyperactivated with the possibility of discovery, we stop the lecture. It's the end. Okay. I think we're a little bit early, which is fine. Yep. Okay. I'm going to sprint. <laughs>